Welcome to the Jungets Games Impressions Vlog. Today I'll be discussing five new games that I was able to play recently, and I'll be going through them in alphabetical order. Now before we jump in, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of those come with pretty cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now jump into the list of games, and the first of these is Cooper Island. Now, I was able to play this one once at Board Game Geek Con just a couple weeks ago, and this is a very new release. It just uh, came out at Spiel, which was just a few weeks before that. Now, this is a heavyweight style Euro game, where each player essentially is on a ship that found this island in the middle of the ocean, and each person's ship has arrived at a different peninsula on this island. Now, what you're doing in this game is a bit of worker placement in order to build out and explore the peninsula that you're on. So each player has their own little dedicated area, and you never actually go into other players' peninsulas. It's a very strangely shaped island. Now, as you are playing through the game, you are going to be expanding out with tiles. You're going to put single uh, hexagonal tiles down, as well as double hexagonal tiles. And the doubles are the ones you're going to put out more often. Now, whenever you put these out into your area, you immediately put cubes on top of those uh, hexagons that match up with the color of that hexagon. So if you put a uh, forested hexagon type down, then you put a wood cube on top to show that that's a wood. Now the key interesting catch for this game involves how this stacking of cubes works, because whenever you want to spend wood, if you pull a cube off of a single layer tile, then it's worth one wood. However, as you are exploring and building out your side of the peninsula, you can stack these tiles on top of each other so that you can now put another tile on top so it's a second level, or maybe a third or fourth or fifth, etc. level. Now, whenever you put a new tile down, you of course put a cube down, just like I said before, but that cube is worth an amount of that stuff equal to the level it is. So if that is a third level forest, then when you pull that uh, wooden cube off, that stands for three wood, and that's really important because you're going to be spending wood, stone, as well as uh, cloth and a couple other resources in order to do a variety of things in this game. Now, uh, I said before that this is a worker placement style game. Uh, each player starts the game with uh, just two workers, and you're going to be going through, I believe it was five rounds to the game? Uh, it's been a couple weeks, so some of the specifics I'm a little loose on. Now, uh, as you're placing these workers out, you can go to spots where other people were, but you have to pay them a little bit of a uh, bonus to them for doing that. And the actions are really uh, all about exploring out your part of the peninsula, as well as um, constructing buildings in your peninsula, which will unlock some special abilities as well as increased storage space. And another thing, a really big aspect of this game involves sailing. Now you all arrived at this island and each person has two ships and one of those ships is going to go clockwise around the island and the other one is going to go counterclockwise around the island. Now there are a variety of ways to move these ships and as you're playing through the game you're going to actually add these little uh, islet tiles down into the water that goes around the perimeter. Now every time one of your ships crosses over one of these islets you get a bonus. So what you want to do in this game, in addition to constructing buildings and building out your peninsula, is you want to send your ships out as far as you can, because you get bonuses for jumping over the islets you put down, and if you send them out far enough, then they actually will go around to the peninsulas of your opponents. Now again, you never interact with the inner part of the peninsula, but as you go by, you can get bonuses from the islets that they place down, and in reality, this sailing track around the outside of the board is kind of like a disguised victory point track, because at the end of the game, you're going to get points for doing a wide variety of things, but one of the big ways you're going to get points is just you're going to get one point for every space you have moved with your ships on this track. Now there's a couple ways that the game allows you to uh, better track this, but essentially every time you move your ship you get one point for each one of those movements. So that's essentially the gist of how this game plays. There's quite a bit going on here as far as uh, subtle specifics. This game has a bunch of free actions which lets you do a whole bunch of things, and we were able to sit down and play a four player game of this which is the max player count. Now uh, I taught this game, I had read the rules I think two full times, <laughs> once right before the convention and once like a month before because I was curious. And the overall teach took a while because there's a few things going on in this game. It seemed like as I taught things, it was pretty straightforward. Like nobody didn't understand what I was saying. We never really had to go back and recover things. But it still took me probably... 40, 45 minutes to get through all of the different things you can do because there are eight different worker placement spots that you could go to and there are a ton of free actions, like I said, and then lots of subtle interactions as you uh, uh, construct boats, which will give you income and uh, a wide variety of things like that. 
So we were able to sit down and play a four-player game of this. Um, we had a uh, brief uh, hiatus in the middle, but I think overall the game probably took about two and a half hours for the four of us, which is not too bad at the end of the day. Like, it's a heavyweight Euro-style game, and I expected that going in. I think we all did. And once the uh, dust settled for our play, I feel like uh, one player really enjoyed it, my friend Dave. He, he was definitely all about it. The other three of us, Enjoyed our play, but we're not quite as enthused with the game overall. I know uh, myself and my friend Matt felt, uh, I believe, somewhat similarly about it, where we liked a lot of the things we were doing, like the exploration and the building up of the tiles in the peninsula was super cool, but there was just so many things that you wanted to do, and it was so hard to actually get to do those things. Uh, like, constructing buildings cost a decent amount of materials, and while you get to stack up these tiles, you'll get uh, more and more efficient cubes to pull off to get lots of resources. It seemed like, at least for a first play, it could be quite challenging. So there were quite a few times where I wanted to do something, and I was one coin short, or one stone short, and that could be kind of frustrating. Now, as I said before, this is a pretty heavy game, so being in situations where you're just a couple resources shy is not an uncommon thing, just as a uh, general part of the uh, heavy Euro gaming genre. So I can't really fault the game for it uh, too much there. And honestly, as I walked away from that first play, I felt like I could see myself playing the game again. But the biggest barrier for me to playing the game again involves the sheer amount of rules and different little things you have to teach as you're going through the game. Uh, I was the teacher, uh, the first and only only time I played it, and I feel like in the future, odds are likely that I would once again be the teacher. And it's just a daunting amount of stuff to go over, and uh, in your first play, you're just going to miss some things and certainly play poorly. Um, I definitely played poorly. I think I came dead last. I didn't check this, but I certainly didn't feel like I was doing good, and I think that uh, actually it was what happened there at the end. I don't think I did very well at all. And I think part of that is because it was a first time playing through the game. Like, I experimented with some things. I decided to skip building a small building and try to build a large building right off the bat. Uh, the large buildings cost twice as much resources as the small ones. And then it seemed to me like the benefits of those large buildings did not really um, give me what I was looking for. I would have rather actually built two small buildings instead uh, for the same amount of resources. Uh, little things like that means the next time I would potentially play this game, I would probably do that. Uh, but there are also so many things going on in this game that there's just parts that it seems like you're just going to not do. Like there's a whole aspect to this game of trying to complete these harbor cards that give you these little uh, cardboard lids which unlock yet another bonus action that you can do to give you a couple extra coins or some resources or that kind of thing as just yet another uh, way to try and get you where you actually need to go. And uh, like I said, one of my friends really liked the game and they liked uh, the amount of options that you have to actually get to where you go. And, I, and honestly, I thought that was kind of cool. Like you want to do a thing and you're like, oh, I can't do it wait a minute, I can get creative. I can sell this cloth for coins, and then you can use the coins to do this, and like swap some stuff around, and then boom, you end up getting the thing that you need, although it might have been inefficient to actually get there. Now, I think personally for me, I would have preferred if the game had been a little more streamlined, if it had less of these free actions go going on, uh, and maybe if it had focused more on the peninsula building part of the game, which to me was the most interesting part. Well, specifically the peninsula building and the uh, ship sailing around the outside. Now, I'm not saying that those were under focused on in the overall design, but there was a lot of other stuff going on, and I feel like for me, personally, if this game had been designed just for me, I would have preferred something that aimed to be 90 minutes, was all about sailing these ships around to look at other people's peninsulas as you build them out, building your own peninsula, and using that cool stacking mechanism to get good resources, but maybe just cut off a lot of the other uh, bobs and bits that were in the game that just uh, seemed to bog it down from a teach perspective and from a uh, crunchy perspective for me. But again, that's just my personal preference. In general, I prefer games to be not super heavy, and this is not the heaviest game I've played by any means. Uh, to a certain extent, it seems like a very simple worker placement game with just a whole bunch of stuff stacked up around it, and I don't necessarily think it's objectively bad that that stuff was uh, stacked around it. Just subjectively for me, um, I could have done with probably at least one-third less things going on to really streamline to the experience that I was looking for. All right, let's now move on to the second game, which is Darwin's Choice. Now, this one was kickstarted, I think, a year ago or so, and I got a production copy of it about five months ago, and I was finally able to play this one just yesterday, actually. Uh, so this is a game that says it plays two to six players, and we played a four-player game of this one. Now, what you're doing in this game is you are trying to create the best adapted animals for a variety of biomes as you go through four overall um, rounds or eras in the, uh, the game. 
Now, what you're doing here is you have a variety of cards in front of you. Some of them are large, some of them are small, and you are literally piecing these together to actually create these animals. There might be a, a great white shark head at the front, um, then after that there's like an antelope back, and then it's got uh, butterfly wings on the top, and, you know, uh, something crazy down below. I can't even think, like a humpback whale uh, bottom down underneath. And this might be something that you want to send out into a biome that it's well adapted for. Now, in a four-player game, there are four of these biomes that you're going for, and each one has a requirement. Now, if this is a cold biome, like maybe a high mountain, then that means you have to have some cold adaptability, and if there's any hot adaptability in your animal, then it just won't work because it's just not going to uh, survive in that area. Or perhaps it's a, a forest, and in this case, being able to fly and climb are really good. Now, each one of the cards has these attributes printed on them. So you're going to build this animal, and then you're going to choose a biome, you're going to put it out there, and you're going to count up the amount of, of these uh, icons that match the adapt adaptation benefit for that biome, and then you will sort them based off of how adapted they are. So if I create this uh, animal, and I put it over here, and it has seven adaptation matches, then it would go above something that had five, and underneath something else that had maybe eight. Now, what you're doing in this game is you're playing through four overall eras, and on your turn, you can either create an uh, animal, or you can mutate an animal you already had, or you can migrate an animal that you already had. Now, this is important because in the first era of the game, nobody has any of these animals at all. Now, when you create them, that's essentially the action that you could get to do for that animal. You can only do one action per animal per round in the overall game. So that means the first full quarter of the game just involves building these animals. You don't do anything else. Then what you do is you check to see if things are able to eat enough. Now, the food is going to trickle down based off of the overall adaptation amount for each of these animals, and if there's not enough food, then the animals will get knocked out. Now, there's a couple uh, uh, little side things going on, like omnivores can eat, eat uh, vegetation and meat, and there are carnivores as well, and they can potentially eat uh, less adapted uh, and less uh, competitive uh, herbivores, and, but I won't go into the details of that. Now, uh, once everything dies out, you actually put these little Darwin points down onto the monsters, or, I'm sorry, animals. <laughs> they look like monsters. And uh, the best ones in the different zones will get extra points, and then the overall most competitive animals uh, will also get some extra points. And those are just these little trophy icons that are on the animals, and I don't think I need to go into too many specifics of that. That effectively shows how intelligent and um, just, you know, savvy that overall animal is. Now, uh, once you go into the second round, you now have the ability to create new animals, or you can mutate an animal you already had, or you can migrate it into an entirely different biome. Now that's important because the biomes are going to change. In a four-player game, in the first round, or I guess in the second round, half of the biomes will change, and then in the third and fourth rounds, three quarters of the biomes will just become something completely different. So in our game, we had a, a coastal uh, coral reef type thing turn into a high desert. <laughs> so obviously that's a big change. So suddenly you have to do some adaptation or you have to move those animals out. Now when you adapt, you just add, remove, or swap out uh, these cards from the cards you have in your hand. And at the start of each one of the rounds of the game, you have 10 cards in your hand. So it's quite a lot to uh, hold. We use some card holders to kind of help out with that. Now, uh, whenever your animals die, you will lose all of the points on that animal except for one. So that means you're kind of okay with having a weak animal that survived one round die off because it only had one point on it. However, if you build an animal right at the very first round of the game and it survives through three rounds, it's now got maybe like nine or ten points on it. And uh, it, spoiler alert, at the end of our one game, a winning score is 29. So if you have a single animal that has nine points on it and then you're not able to migrate it or adapt it to be able to survive in a new area, then that's a pretty big punch because it's going to die and you're going to take one of those points and lose the other eight. So this game is all about trying to uh, create these animals that will uh, live throughout all the eras and then pay out big at the end of the game if they're still alive. Now, uh, we played a four-player game of this, and right off the bat, I'm going to say from a positive perspective, we all loved the animal creation process right from the very first moment we started playing. I think even before I started teaching and people just saw the cards, they were just enamored with the idea of crafting these ridiculous animals uh, together. Like, some really fun and interesting animals were created over the course of the game and I super enjoyed that. I also like the idea of mutating these animals to try and match up with the things that are going on, but unfortunately, I'm now going to hit into the parts where the game kind of fell down. Uh, it, there are a couple different areas for this. The first one is just a fiddliness perspective. Uh, we played a four-player game, and this game technically goes up to six players, and we have a large uh, uh, dining room table that we play games on. Oftentimes, we can get two uh, moderate-sized games being played by like eight people, and for us, our four-player game took up 
80% of this table just splaying out all of these different animals from the different biomes because they just take a lot of space. And then what happens is a biome changes at the end of an era or maybe a new creature is made and you now have to check the adaptation of all of the different animals and then you have to maybe slide these down and then move this one over here. If you're migrating, you have to pick up, you know, maybe even five cards with tokens on top of it and then you're pushing things over and it just was really fiddly and slow to move these things around. Now, on top of that, from a computation perspective, it just felt like we were constantly running the numbers on how adapted various things were. Now, since this play, I've gone online and I've seen lots of people say things like, you know, get a bunch of D12s and you can like put that down on the animal to say this has seven adaptation there so you don't have to rerun the numbers. But I didn't play with that because I was just playing with the stuff that came out of the box. And it seems like we spent a incredible amount of time counting up the uh, various adaptations, making sure things were correct, and also just crunching to try and figure out are you able to actually build a uh, uh, animal that can fit in into a specific spot out on the board? What this ended up meaning is that there was a lot of downtime and this game was long. Now, um, I think it was uh, supposed to be nowhere near as long as this, but in our four player game, at the end of the day, I think we were approaching three hours, which is kind of crazy. Now, a part of that is, is probably on us. Maybe we were spending too much time crunching all of this different um, adaptability stuff and really going through the numbers, maybe we should have gotten out dice as markers earlier on. But I don't know, it just seemed like time was just falling away as we were playing this game. And in fact, sometimes you're not going to take that many actions. In fact, in the second or third round of this game, I took one action, and that was it. I uh, created a, uh, a species, and then I had a couple other ones out that survived the first round. But there was nothing I could do to mutate them to make them better, and there was no place to actually migrate them that would help out. So I just took one action and passed, and like... I don't know, 30 minutes later, it was my turn to go again because everyone else took all of these other actions, slowly crunching through these possibilities. Now, again, maybe part of that is on us. I don't know. But, you know, in general, we're not the slowest group of players in the world. And it just seemed like there was just so much to crunch and so much going on that things really bogged down with the amount of uh, stuff that we were really trying to go through. So um, at the end of the day, this game was way longer than we wanted or it really should have been. And I have uh, a few thoughts on that. I, realistically, I think that from a theme perspective, this game is uh, it's great. Like it really hits that theme super hard. You've got the adaptability and you have all these different um, uh, icons that are on the cards. You're building these awesome creatures that are going into different biomes. I love all of that. But from a gameplay perspective, it seems like things just strayed away from where they should have been. It seems like maybe things were just too focused on the theme and the gameplay actually um, uh, faltered because of that. I feel like this game, realistically from my perspective, should have had a lot less crunching than it needed. I feel like all of the adaptability that you're adding up, like, okay, how many climbing icons do I have and how many flight icons do I have on this animal to that animal to this other one? I feel like that stuff should have been like just a threshold. And then the moment that animal is in there, the only thing you check is its uh, overall um, uh, competitive advantage. That's just the trophies and that's a lot easier to keep track of. Also, I just think maybe there could have been ways to make this less fiddly overall. I just, I feel like there was a really great 90 minute game, a uh, 60 to 90 minute game in here somewhere, but it got bogged down with the amount of just kind of area majority fussy bookkeeping that we had to do constantly. Uh, in addition to all this, we're also counting, you know, where is the food going, you know, going to the most adapted and then herbivores getting this, and then this is an omnivore, so it's taking this and that, so it's going to take that away from this. So trying to figure out the ramifications of your actions was tricky, which is, I think, part of the reason why this one just took a really, really long time to play. So at the end of the day, I wanted to really like this game because from a theme perspective, I think it's fun. From a tactile perspective, it's, it's cool to build out these different uh, animals, but from from a uh, rubber meets the road gameplay perspective, the actual stuff that we're doing just ground us to such a slow pace that I just don't think I'm going to be coming back to this one, unfortunately. We've now reached game number three, and this one is It's a Wonderful World. Now, this is a new release, and a uh, review copy was sent to me by Lucky Duck Games. And this is a hand-drafting style game, so it's somewhat similar to Seven Wonders, in that as you're playing through the game, you're going to start each round with a handful of cards. You will then choose one card and put it face down in front of you simultaneously, as everyone else does this. You then pass the cards that you have left to the person to your left or right, and then you uh, reveal the card you chose, and then you pick up the new cards, and you choose again. And you're going to keep doing this until you've picked seven cards overall. Now, uh, what you're doing after you've chosen this card is you are trying to essentially build up an engine. This is very much an engine building style game. 
So each one of these cards in the game has a couple different things going on it. Uh, in the top left, there are some icons, which is the cost to get this built down as a building. Now in the uh, very bottom of the card, it might show you things like a variety of ways to get extra victory points, or it might say uh, the amount of resources that card will make once it is constructed. And then in the right middle section, there is a recycling value. Now this is important because once we everybody has drafted all of their cards and their seven face-up cards in front of them, they then have to plan these cards out. And you have to either take a card and put it up into your construction area and you're saying, I'm going to try to build that card by getting the resources that are associated with the top left side, or you can discard that card and take one resource of the recycle value on that card. So what you're trying to do in this game is get the cards that are going to be good for your engine while also drafting other cards that will just give you resources to build the cards that you already have. Now, once everybody has planned everything out, then what you do is production, and you work down the middle of the table, there's a board, and it has the uh, five overall types of resources. You start off with the gray materials, or white materials, which is uh, just, I think, material, and what uh, everybody does is they simultaneously look down to their constructed buildings area, and they count the number of that color icon they have, and that's the amount of material they make. So they take those, and they can then put those down onto the buildings they have in their construction yard. Obviously, you put the cubes down onto the matching spot. And if you don't have any matching spots, you just put it onto your own player board. And every time you have five of any cube on your own player card, you get rid of them for a wild cube, essentially. Now, uh, once you complete these buildings, you then put them into your complete building area, and they can then start producing more materials to complete more buildings. So that's obviously the uh, relatively simple uh, engine building aspect to the game. Now, one neat thing about this game is that as you're going through production, you always go from uh, in the exact same order. So what that means is you might get those materials and use that to construct a building that makes science, and you haven't done science yet. So now that building is constructed, it goes up to the top, and now that will create science later on within this given round. And that's important because you're only going to play through four rounds. So you're going to do each one of these things essentially four times, and then the game will be over. Now, it is worth mentioning that uh, the player who makes the most of each of the five different types will get a bonus chit, either a little financier, which is worth one point, or a little general, which is worth one point. Now, there are different colors because in the game, there are different uh, cards which give you bonuses for a variety of different things. Uh, there might be a card that says, get one point for every financier you have at the end of the game. Well, each financier is worth a point already, so that card essentially lets you double count your financiers. And if you get a couple of these cards, then that could really work out well in your favor. Now, uh, when I first read the rules to this one, I was a little bit worried that it was going to be just too light. Like, the uh, the effects on the buildings are uh, just get points, either straight points or conditional points, or give you uh, manufacturing to make more materials, to make more buildings, which lets you make more materials and more buildings to give you points. Uh, that seemed a bit simplistic overall, but I decided to give this one a shot. Now, I played this one just once, and it was a two-player only game. Uh, the two-player plays very, very, very similarly to the other ones. It's effectively the exact same. And uh, I have to say, I really quite enjoyed it. Uh, I went to, I played this one with my wife, Jessica, and she had the same impression going in. As I taught the rules, she thought, oh, this might not, there might not be much here. But as we were playing through the game, we realized that there's quite a bit to think about, especially once you get into that like second and third uh, round of the game. You have a lot of resources that you're making. So you're uh, as you're drafting, you're trying to plan out. You're like, okay, I'm making three of the black and then th uh, two of the green. And okay, I can take two of the black, but I'm, I'm going to have one wasted black. Well, I, maybe I'll draft this card because that needs black, but then I also need some of the yellow. So do I have any extra yellow? And you're really trying to piece all these things together. And uh, when the dust settled at the end of our game, uh, Jessica edged me out by, I think, about 15 points or so. Uh, we both, I think, did pretty well. We kind of went after different strategies. Um, uh, she went, uh, I think, very uh, deep on a couple of things, and I went relatively wide. And uh, when the dust settled at the end of the game, I think, uh, well, A, we both enjoyed it, and B, I found myself saying that I'm glad the game was as simple and streamlined as it was. It feels like it wouldn't surprise me if in development the game was more complicated and they actually stripped some stuff away to try and hone in on the key decisions that you're making as you're specifically doing the draft. Um, if there's too much going on, then this really could bog down into AP, which is not something you want with a game that is as relatively light as this one. So I'm not here saying this is a heavy game or even, uh, you know, a super heavy side of medium weight game. But to me, it was not as light as it seemed. Like it definitely, there was a, it was a lot crunchier than I expected, especially once we got into the later parts of the game. And this is one I'm looking forward to playing more. Uh, the fact that it's a hand drafting game with everybody taking all of their actions simultaneously means it probably plays well going all the way up to five players. And I'm looking forward to trying this one more. I think our two player game probably came in at about 40 to 45 minutes, which is uh, a really good sweet spot for a lighter game that has a decent amount of decisions to make. And again, there was uh, a lot more to think about here than I expected going in, and I was very pleasantly surprised with it.
Okay, it's now time for the fourth game, which is Marco Polo 2. Now, I think technically it's called Marco Polo in the Service of the Great Khan or something like that, but this is effectively a direct sequel to Marco Polo, which came out a few years ago, and that was The Voyages of Marco Polo. Now, there are a lot of similarities between these two games. Uh, in both of these games, you have dice work replacement, where at the start of each round, you're going to roll your dice in front of you, and then you are going to be placing those dice out to do a variety of things. That might allow you to move pawns around on a map in both of these games, it also might allow you to get resources that you can then use to complete contracts, which will give you more resources and more victory points, uh, and the same goes for both of these two games. Now, uh, Marco Polo 1 is a game that I really wanted to love, but at the end of the day, it was just a little bit too tight and punishing for my tastes. A lot of people love the first game for that, uh, but for me, I just found myself getting really frustrated in my plays, and so ultimately I play games to have fun, and that game was not quite fun enough for me, so I ended up uh, getting rid of my copy. And part of that was because I knew that there was a second one coming out, and I was very curious to try it because I wanted to see if it was the Marco Polo for me. Well, spoiler alert, it absolutely is. I actually love Marco Polo 2. Uh, now, I was able to play this twice at Board Game Geek Con a couple weeks ago. Uh, we played it a second time mostly because I loved the first place so much, and uh, a new person came into the um, overall group, and I was just like, let's play this because it's great. Uh, and I love that second play as well. Now, um, there are a lot of similarities between these two games, and there are some uh, definite differences as well, and I could sit here and talk for a long time about what all of those are, but that's not really what this Impressions vlog is about. Uh, there's a lot of materials on the internet to go and check that out, so I think I'm going to try to really uh, hone in on why I had so much fun with Marco Polo 2, and maybe briefly mention Marco Polo 1 when, when it comes around. Now, the first thing that really, I guess, frustrated me about Marco Polo 1 was it could be hard to move around the map. Uh, again, a lot of people liked that it was difficult to make that movement happen. It felt very thematic, but for me, it was just frustrating. Now, in Marco Polo 2, there is a lot more focus on map movement because in Marco Polo 2, that's how you get contracts. In the first game, there was just a row of contracts at the bottom of the board, and you could uh, spend your dice to pick up contracts, and then you, of course, spend resources to complete those. Well, in Marco Polo 2, there is no row. Instead, out on the uh, main map, there are a variety of cities, and some of these cities have contracts on them. So if you want to get contracts, you have to move over to that city and essentially put a little uh, trading post down there, and then from that point on in the game, those are contracts that are available to you when you do the get contracts action. So with that means is you have to move in this game. You cannot just sit there at the front and complete contracts and not really move. Now, I think if you didn't really move in the first game, you probably weren't going to be super viable. Like, I think you needed to move in order to be good. But the fact that Marco Polo 2 just kicks you in the butt and says, you have to move, like you're going to complete your starting contract. And if you want more contracts, you've got to go into a new city. Now, what that means is you can go into a direction that other people aren't going. And that effectively means a couple of these uh, contract spots might be effectively yours. And you don't have to worry about somebody else coming in and swooping in to take those contracts. Um, now, it also means maybe contracts come out into that spot that you're not interested in, which maybe motivates you to go into other cities that have contracts to increase the number of options that you have available to you. So I really liked that aspect of the game. I, honestly, the biggest thing that I liked uh, as a difference to the first game was how uh, much movement is easier to do. I just think, feel like it, for me personally, I, if there's a big map, I want to move around that map. I don't want to feel like I am, you know, uh, clawing tooth and nail to get any movement to happen. And, and of course, maybe I was just bad at playing Marco Polo 1, but either way, I love that part of the second game. Now, in both of these games, each player is going to take on an asymmetric role, which has a pretty significant impact on the uh, rules differences. Uh, in the first game, you had some pretty crazy ones. Honestly, there's one that gives you resources whenever anyone goes to the main part of the board to get resources, so you just get free stuff. There was another person that let you just set your dice to be whatever uh, faces you wanted. So if you hate randomness in games, then you could play that character. Now, in the second game, it seemed to me like the characters overall were a little less crazy as far as how uh, their uh, power levels seemed to be all over the place, uh, specifically with the effects they have. There's no uh, person that does not roll the dice in a dice game, for instance. Uh, they seemed more specific to strategies that you're going to want to play. For instance, in my first play, I used a character that was able to essentially not use oases as stopping points on the map. Um, on the map, there are cities and then small little oases, and normally you have to stop over there, and that's an extra movement. But I played a character that just skipped right over them, so I was faster than before. But I actually had to pay for all of the resources, so I had to get a lot of resources together to do that. But every time I jumped over an oasis, I got extra points. So 
my first game, I just went crazy. I just went all over the map trying to hunt down all of the oases that I could, and I think I ended up jumping over nine of them, which gave me uh, nine times three, or uh, 27 points, which was a decent amount of the uh, overall points that I got in that game, and I only completed one contract in that first play. Now, I did get a thing or two wrong in that first play, and in fact, at this point, I do want to mention the only gripe I currently have about Marco Polo 2, and that is the fact that there is a new resource called Jade, and it is better than you might think if you skim through the rules. Now, um, Jade is a resource that you can spend to get a variety of other stuff that you need, like camels as well as money, uh, which help you move around on the map. But we didn't find out until halfway through our second play of Marco Polo 2 that Jade can also be used as a camel or a money. Now, if you've ever played either of these Marco Polos, you'll know that camels and money are crucially important to this game, especially for moving around the map. And uh, we were actually halfway through our second play when a friend came over and he was like, oh yeah, I really enjoyed this game. And he's like, oh, you, you have the Jade person. I was playing a character in my second play that uh, got a lot of Jade for completing contracts and got points for Jade. And he said, uh, wow, that, that person seems really strong considering you can spend Jade as camels and money. And all of us at the table said, what? What are you talking about? Uh, that's not on any of the player aids or anything. And so we ended up getting into the rulebook. And this rule is taught in the clarifications section of the rulebook. So uh, the person who taught the game the first time read through the whole book and I guess missed the clarifications page because we want to jump into playing the game. And we missed this super crucial rule. So that's it's a bit of a nitpick as far as the only issue I have with the game at this point. Um, but man, that should have been on the player aid so that you know that Jade is even better than it seemed. Um, so either way, I'm honestly losing a little bit of track of where I'm going because I'm kind of talking about two games at the same time. So I think at this point I should maybe start trying to wrap this up by saying that I loved both of my plays of Marco Polo 2. And just like Marco Polo 1, I do have to say that I'm not entirely sure the characters are balanced. <laughs> uh, I haven't talked about a lot of them overall, but it did seem on the outset like some of them seemed stronger than others. I uh, destroyed that second game with the uh, this character who got a jade every time I completed a contract and got a point every time I got a jade. So I just went hard on contracts and I went hard on jade and I did very well in that second play. Uh, I'm not sitting here saying that it's imbalanced and that one's overpowered, but I can say that I did very well with that. So I kind of like to play this game again in the future. Um, honestly, a lot in the future because I had so much fun. Uh, and I do want to try both of the players, the characters that I played already to see if I can do uh, better with them and specifically to see if I just dominate again with that Jade player. So from a balance perspective, I don't know if they are actually balanced, but what I do know is that they're fun. Uh, one of the characters that uh, one of my opponents played in the second game uh, did not have to play any resources while traveling, but they could only ever move one step at a time. So, uh, well, specifically with uh, that one part of the uh, the board. So they were really slow and steady, but they just had tons of camels and money to be spent doing other things because they were not spending those uh, trying to actually move out on the board. So. At this point, I've actually bought a copy of Marco Polo 2. It's uh, not out in English yet, but it's language independent, and it's currently on the uh, Amazon.de store. And I enjoy this game so much that I decided this is one I don't really want to wait until mid-2020 to have a copy of. So uh, that one's going to be showing up at some point in the next couple weeks, and I am actively looking forward to playing this one more. It's just a really fun Yuri game. It is definitely what I wanted Marco Polo 1 to be. Um, if you loved the tightness and the, uh, the the really the tough part of Marco Polo 1, then maybe avoid Marco Polo 2. But if the uh, the amount of difficulty you had piecing together plans in the first one really turned you off, then definitely take a look at the second one. Because for me, um, I loved it. it. Honestly, it was one of the best games that I played at the convention. And at this point, it's one of the best games that I played this year. I really, really enjoyed playing it. Okay, we've now reached the fifth and final game I'll be talking about today, and that one is Sanctum. Now, this is a new release by CGE Games, and for all intents and purposes, this is Diablo the board game. Uh, Diablo obviously being the video game that's, you know, Diablo 1, 2, and 3 that have been coming out for the last couple decades. Uh, now, from a personal perspective, I loved those video games when I was a kid. Uh, I put in hundreds of hours into Diablo 2 when I was in college, and, you know, probably, you know, easily 100 hours into the first one way before college. So, uh, there's a soft spot in my heart for this overall theme. And uh, so what's going on in this game is you have effectively each player uh, playing a character and each one is pretty unique with their overall powers. Now at the start of the game, you don't have any special abilities on your player board. And as you, you go through the game, you're going to be going through an overland adventure, essentially. Um, there is effectively a long track going down multiple boards. You start off in this lush green country and you're heading all the way to effectively the gates of hell to fight what is essentially the devil, but I think it's called the, the hell beast or something like that in the game. 
Now, um, what you do in this game is each one of your turns is going to involve making a choice. Do you want to move or do you want to fight or do you want to rest? I think those are the three main things that you do. Now, when you move, you simply take your player uh, piece wherever it is on the track and you move it to the uh, next spot right in front of the previous person who is the farthest up. So it's essentially this little line of uh, player pieces that are just constantly leapfrogging over themselves as they march down this path. So what that effectively means is the boards in the middle of the table are just a time track as you are just going through a certain amount of steps before you get to hell at the very end of the game. Now, every time you move, after you move, you will then pick some monsters that you are going to have to fight at some point. It's a bit of a uh, pool draft mechanism going on. Uh, you will always have a certain number of pools available. I can't remember exactly how many it is. And the types of minions or monsters in those pools will differ depending on what board you're at. So um, this track is a little bit more than just a time track. Uh, the minions are really easy to fight in the first board. And once you get later on, the icons show that you bring out a uh, second level or even the hardest to defeat third level uh, monsters as you get closer and closer to the gates of hell. Now, uh, when you uh, choose the monsters to take, you just look at the ones that are available, you take one or two or three potentially that are in these pool groups, and then you put it in front of you, and they are just going to sit there until you fight them. So that's going to finish out your turn. You moved, you found some monsters to fight, and that's it. So on a future turn, you might decide to fight those monsters, and the way this works is you're going to roll a set of standard D6 dice. Now, again, I can't remember the specifics of how many you start with, but I, you have, I think you start with just two, and then you want like a third one and then a fourth and then eventually a potential fifth one later on as you go uh, deeper into the game. Now, what you do is you roll these dice and then each one of the monsters that you're trying to fight has dice icons on them that show pip values. So maybe you have this easy monster that just shows a two and you have this medium monster that shows a five and a one. Now that means if you want to defeat that um, easy monster that just had the two on it, you have to roll a two and then you take that two and you put it on top of the easy monster. It is killed and then what you do is you flip it over and that monster turns into a piece of equipment that you then have the option of putting onto your person which increases your abilities later on. Now you can't equip just yet, you have to do that when you rest. Um, so what you're trying to do is defeat a lot of monsters, put them over to your equipment area, and then do a rest action later on to put all this nice fancy stuff down onto your player board. Now there's a little bit more that you're doing here in combat because obviously if you're just rolling dice and hoping to get lucky, well, there's not much of a game there. And there are a lot of ways that the game lets you manipulate dice and also just get free dice hits. Now, um, you have your player board, and at the start of the game, you have no equipment on it, but you still have some abilities. Now, you can spend stamina to try and block some damage that's coming in from the monsters that you aren't able to kill, and you also have um, the blue stuff, which is wisdom or something like that, I forget exactly, um, that you can use uh, more often than not to actually modify your dice. Uh, maybe plus one, minus one, plus two, or minus two, and that will help you get the die rolls that you need to actually defeat these monsters. Now, in addition to that, each person has a rage token, and you you can just flip that over to get a free hit on any monster. So the game definitely leans into letting you actually progress. Like it says, okay, that was a bad roll where here's some ways to change that. And you know what? Here's a freebie hit anyway. Now, the thing is you do have to flip your rage token over when you use that freebie hit and it will only refresh once you finish a battle fight where you have at least one die unused and at least one monster hitting you. So that's kind of like a catch up mechanism as well. If you had a battle not really go your way, then at least you got to refresh your rage token to get another free hit in the next time you attack. Now also, every time you defeat one of these monsters, in addition to turning into equipment, you also get to upgrade your skills. Now each of the uh, players that you, uh, or the characters that you play, has their own custom deck, essentially, of skills that you're going to play. And every time you play Barbarian, you're going to put them out in the exact same way, I believe, on your player board. Now each of these skills has these little colored tokens put on top of it, and if you defeat a green monster, then that means you can upgrade one of your green uh, tokens. So you essentially find a green token on your skill board, and you move it up once. Now if you move it up up all the way to the top, then that becomes a token that you can then use to actually power up the equipment that you want to put onto your person. You can't just put a card down on top of yourself. If you want to put down a sword that requires, um, that has a little green icon on it, that means you have to put the sword there and then take a green token that you were able to upgrade up from 
your skill tree and put that down onto the sword to activate it so that you can actually use it. Um, so it's important to try and move these up, but also every time you clear all of the tokens off of one of the skills in your skill area, you unlock that skill and you put it over to the left-hand side of your board and it increases the ability for you to do stuff. And each one of the players is pretty different in that respect. Um, in the one play that I've had of this game so far, I played the Barbarian. And as I went through the game, I was able to unlock a second rage token. I was able to unlock a new way to actually flip my rage token. So I got even more rage, which is more free hits. And then there were um, lots of ways to get more health and I could potentially, you know, tank a lot of damage, which is an important thing. And it's a very Barbarian type thing to do. Um, there was also a kind of rogue-esque character that had some very roguey type abilities. I don't remember specifically what they are. They were across the table from me. But um, trying to plot out these skills is really something that you're thinking about uh, realistically when you're trying to pick which monsters to fight. Um, you have all of these pools of monsters to choose from, and you might say, well, this one has a blue and a green monster, and over here I would really like to do a blue and a green upgrade because that would free up this card, and also I need one more blue token to activate this awesome set of, uh, this awesome breastplate that I want to put on that's going to increase my ability to mitigate die rolls. So you're trying to fight the monsters that make sense, but also that maybe have die rolls that match because there's also equipment that where you can just like put a blue token down and it says, get an automatic four. So if you have a breastplate that gets you an automatic four activation and there's a monster out there that has one of the token, uh, the hit spots on it says four, well, you want to take that monster because you have a guaranteed hit in there already. And so this game is really about trying to piece those things together. Now, uh, once you adventure from the nice grassy lands all the way up to the very gates of hell, um, you effectively uh, have kind of a mini boss type situation where you just fight a couple really hard monsters and then you go in to a second type of game where you actually fight the devil himself, essentially. Um, I can't, again, remember, the, I think it was like the Lord Hellbeast or something like that. Now, I'm going to try not to go into the specifics of this too much, but the, the game is totally different once you're in this second part of the game. Uh, you actually build out this track of cards that are like you know, Devil Fury cards effectively, and you have to work your way down this personal track that's in front of you, and if you're able to get to the very end, then you've defeated the uh, Devil, and if you're the only person to defeat him, then you win. If multiple people defeat the Devil, then the person who ends it with the most health is going to win. Or it could be like the game that we played, where we were just one freaking hit away from me. I was one hit away from defeating the uh, the Devil, but I got the most hits in, so that means everybody lost uh, effectively, like thematically, everybody lost, we were not able to defeat, uh, to defeat the devil at the very end, but I still won the game because I got the closest to defeating the devil. And in that last part of the game, there is actually no cooperation. You're effectively all fighting, I guess, a different limb of the devil or something like that. Uh, if I do really well, it doesn't help somebody else across the table. But it's a really challenging thing that I won't go into the specifics of, but it's, it's kind of crazy. The very last part of the game is just attack, attack, attack. You can't rest. You can't do any of that stuff anymore. And you just hope that you've geared up enough to actually survive. Now, uh, I played this game once, and it was a full four-player game of it, and I think it was probably around two hours, which is maybe a little bit longer than I expected, but it did not necessarily overstay its welcome. Now, as I was playing this game, I, I really enjoyed it, honestly, and that kind of makes it sound like I didn't enjoy it at the very end. I had fun with this one the entire way through. I, I liked uh, trying to uh, pick out the right monsters to kind of puzzle through how I was going to do my skill tree better. I liked the amount of dice mitigation that's in this game to really handle the fact that there's a decent amount of randomness of rolling the dice. I really liked uh, equipping out my uh, hero with a wide variety of kind of <laughs> very strange uh, armor type that really matched up with the skills that I had going on. And the boss battle at the very end of the game was cool. Uh, all that being said, I do kind of worry about the replayability of the game. Uh, I played as the Barbarian, and I feel like I barbarianed it very well, and I'm not sure how interested I would be in playing the Barbarian again. I'm quite curious to try one of the other uh, uh, different hero types. In fact, um, part of me wants to play this game four times to try all four of the different types, but I'm not sure if I would be motivated to play the game the fifth time because the actual process of the game itself, of the, the Overland Adventure going into the battle with the devil at the very end, I don't think it's going to be that different from one game to the next. I, I like from a thematic perspective, I liked dropping through the different uh, overland areas as things got harder. I liked the gearing up and all that kind of stuff, but I kind of feel like I wish the game had maybe 
sprinkled in like some mini bosses that are different every time you play the game. Like they, they function differently. Like, oh my gosh, I hit the slug beast thing. Like that means it's going to eat my armor until I defeat it. And then it comes back or just some variety there. Um, when you fight the devil at the very end, you're going to put out a random set of cards and one fight against the devil will be different from another based off of what these cards look like, but they're not going to be drastically different overall. So uh, while I, I had fun with uh, this game, I think pretty much every minute of this game, I was enjoying myself and I do see myself playing it again a couple times. I'm not sure if I'm going to be playing it more than enough times to try all of the different characters in the game, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe after I play this one again, I will uh, uh, see the allure overall there. Certainly, uh, I had a lot of fun with the game, and I am looking forward to getting at least a couple more plays in. All right, that's going to bring me to the end of this impressions vlog. I've actually played a lot of new games over the last few weeks, uh, 28 to be exact, and I've only talked about five of them today. So I will be uh, putting more of these out than usual, sprinkling them out through the next few weeks as I go through a lot of the new games that I was able to play at Board Game Geek Con, as well as just at the house because there's lots of new games coming in as well. So um, I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts on these games here and definitely keep your eye out for more. Uh, there's going to be a lot more coming out soon. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.